Well, welcome back, one and all. If you're new here, my name is Rusty. And this is my channel where I talk about my favorite movies, mostly horror, and my favorite music, mostly metal. And we are here to finish up the Cold Prey trilogy. And yeah, we are going to move on now to Cold Prey 3. Which I can't hold up from you. And uh, Cold Prey 3 is, it's a, it's a really sad, the company went. And before they went, the only thing that they w uh, were able to do after the release of this movie was they managed two releases, I believe um, a German and a French, I believe. And that was it. There is no official release of Cold Prey 3 with English dub or subtitles. So, whereas you might, for a hefty price, find a French or German release of the DVD or Blu-ray, um, it has no English subtitles. There isn't one to find, even if you want it. However, because the movie was so loved, this, then the franchise was so loved, they did, um, a fan did take a Blu-ray rip and made a English subtitles, proper, correct English subtitles to it. And I believe that's the one that Shudder used. Um, Shudder, if I'm correct, Shudder did a viewing of Cold Prey 3 for a little bit. I don't think it's still there. I'm not sure. I don't think so. Uh, but they did, for a short period of time, uh, have Cold Prey 3, the one with the English subtitles on it. Or at least that's what I was told. So you can find it by going to one of those movie sites that show entire movies and um, it's it's there and uh, you can download it you you know it, in other words it floats around and I have the um, high quality blu-ray rip with the uh, fan made so uh, English subtitles on it so that's how I have it and um, I would love to, I, w I wish somebody would get a hold of the movie and make a release. Scream Factory, if you're listening, you know, you could do that for me, if you don't mind. But in any event, now this movie, like I had mentioned in earlier ones, this movie is on my top 20 slashers of all time. And... There may be some haters out there that go why, and um, I think personally think you're a dipshit if you're into slashers and you don't think that this is a 10 out of 10, 9.5 out of 10, or 9 out of 10, um, because it is a phenomenal, phenomenal slasher. Now, Cold Prey 3 is a prequel to the first two movies that we talked about, so... Um, it opens up, well, first the stats. It was released in 2010, directed by Mikhail Brian Sandemos, writer Peter Fekluret, <laughs> Ida Marie Buckyard, Julie Rusty, and Kim Falk star in it, amongst others. And, yeah, so... It was released in 2010. Now, the movie opens in 1970, uh, this is like the end of 1975, uh, in January 76. Um, we see the lodge that we have come to know in the first two movies. But we see it in its active state. We see the mother cleaning up the dining room, and we see Gunner little 11 year old boy with the facial birthmark and um, it, it's 
so sad. A lot of people don't like when empathy is brought up. You know, when a movie makes you feel any empathy for a villain. But I've always been able, perhaps it's my history in criminal psychology, but um, I can separate that. I can feel sorry about the child, Gunner, and I can understand why you became the monster that you did without in any way shape or form having that impact my disgust and punishment and consequence in other words I still want the killer dead um, if they had lived I would want them executed despite feeling tremendous sorrow and sadness for the 11 year old that he was before he became the monster. I have no problem separating and compartmentalizing those two facts. Some people do, I don't. So we see Gunner um, helping his mom clean up the dining room of the lodge and his father, also named Gunner, comes in and the boy stops and freezes in fear and you hear him like scowl and walk over to the wife and is like, what the fuck is that freak doing up here out of his room? you're like, what the fuck, man? And he then attacks the boy, grabs him, drags him down into the basement, kicking and screaming, with the boy begging, please stop, and all that kind of stuff. And then ends up throwing him into the room where he shuts him up. And you had heard the mom scream you know like he hasn't seen sunlight in days and days and days he was just up here helping me clean up so the dad I guess despises him because of the facial birthmark and has severely abused him so we get to see a little of that and we then see the sheriff the one from the second movie in his younger days of course driving around he's just a cop then but driving around and you can hear the news reports about the missing 11 year old that hadn't been seen now of course we know he was never missing he was being held hostage by his parents in the basement in a room where he wasn't allowed to see the light of day. He was kept down there like an animal. So that's all real sad. <laughs> but um, so we hear the cop hearing about these, you know, this missing boy. And we then see the sheriff go in to a house, a cabin out there in the woods and knock on the door. And it turns out to be his brother, John. And he asks John, you know, have you heard about the kid that's missing? And I just wonder if you had seen him because he's a trapper, a hunter. And I just wonder if you had seen him, um, if maybe he came here or something like that. And what was, what was disgusting about it was that when he knocked on the door, that John guy was cutting up a cat in the sink. And you're like, what the fuck was he doing that for? Obviously, there's more crazy people in these mountains than just that kid.
So you see that there is something between them two because he screams at him that I don't care, I don't want to see you, or you know, because the guy, the the cop tells him our dad's dying, you know, shouldn't you come and see him? And he's like, I don't ever want to see any of you again, and um, fuck all of you and stuff like that. And he looks at him kind of funny, and then he he leaves, and you know, kind of like I just wanted to know if you had seen the kid. Now. We go back, and we see the mom um, in the bathroom back at the lodge, and she hears some kind of noise, and she turns around, doesn't say anything, goes back to what she was doing, taking medicine, uh, turns around, doesn't say anything again, walks out into the bedroom, and there stands Gunner, the kid. 11 year old and she seems genuinely oh my god I'm so glad you're back I'm so glad you're here now we know which I guess what they were trying to show you was that the mom is some kind of victim too because she helped bury him in the snow like we had seen in the flashbacks in the very first movie um, and she's of course been holding him hostage, but she's just doing what she's told. She's just under the power of the dad as well. But she bends down, you know, to hug him and stuff like that, and he pumps like three or four shots of a big kitchen butcher knife right through her. So that was shocking. Didn't see that coming. And then the dad comes in down the hall and I guess he heard the thumps and scream or, or did she scream? I don't think she screamed. But he comes down the hall and then sees blood on the floor, opens up the door and sees her laying in the middle of the room and he kind of falls to his knees and next thing you know he's got a knife through the back of his neck out his throat and the kid killed him too deservedly so it seems <laughs> so it's not like I had like a, a real big problem with them two getting iced but uh This is obviously what started it all. So, we now flash forward to 12 years later, making it 1988. Kim Wilde, You Keep Me Hanging On, is playing on the radio. And you see that it's the sheriff giving a lift to our, our core victim group here, our group of young adults. The pretty people in peril. Uh, we have uh, Hedda, Anders, Siri, Newt, Manga, and Simon. They pronounce it semen, which is unfortunate for anyone named S I M E N from Denmark because they pronounce it semen and I would just prefer to be called Simon because I don't really know. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I, I wouldn't. It wouldn't be acceptable to me to be known through school as Simon. That's all I'm saying. But um, so the sheriff is giving them a lift. They're going to go camping in the woods um, at this lake. And um, but they're real goal they're real what they're really doing is they're wanting to sneak to the abandoned spooky hotel lodge so that's what they're going to do is go to the lodge and have um, a party now 
it had been abandoned what 12 years we're 12 years ahead so the place has been aband abandoned for over a decade at this time so he drops them off at the national park which is where you know this mountain place is so once he drops them off he goes on about his business and they sneak over to the lodge now when they get to the lodge um, and this is all Siri's fault I mean I hate blaming her for it but she basically pusses out and it's like oh no this place is too spooky I don't want to stay here and stuff like that of course they may have been killed anyway I don't know so I don't really know if there's to blame her or not but she's the reason they were out in the woods that's all I got to say so they all agree okay we, we won't stay here then we'll just go you know find um, we'll just go find a place to camp uh, by the lake next to the woods because as we discussed about these movies this movie is Friday the 13th with a little Texas Chainsaw Massacre. That's what this movie is a nod to. First one was The Shining. Second one was Halloween 2. And this one is Friday the 13th and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre mixed together. Um, so, well, more Friday the 13th. But, uh, a significant healthy dose of Texas Chainsaw. So, um, after the sheriff had dropped them off and they had went and done all of this, he runs across his brother. And remember, this is 12 years later from that scene where we saw him ask about the little boy. Um, he runs across him on the side of the road where his truck had broken down. He stopped and tried to help him. The guy, of course, wouldn't hardly speak to him had not spoke to him since and wouldn't accept any help um, so one of the things that the kids the kids had talked about when they were going to the motel was about that missing boy um, so they get to the lake and then we have the typical sleepaway camp Friday the 13th type stuff um, they go skinny dipping uh, they light a fire, they hang out, a couple of them has got, they got a, pa a pack of beer with them, um, they got, uh, one of them actually even brought a rifle with him, which freaked the other ones out, but, um, you know, so they're doing all of that kind of stuff, and those were some cool get into the Friday the 13th mood scenes, and then after they all lay down around the fire, Siri and Newt decide to go off in the woods and play wild animal, you know. They're going to go get get their groove on out in the bushes, I guess doing a, a little public wildlife sex or whatever. So they're out there, and that's what they're going to do. When they notice something hanging from a tree, and they walk up to it, and it's like, it's like a half a boar, you know, like a wild, a wild dog, and it's hanging from the tree. Now, they're like, what the hell is that? And they get closer to it, and they can see that it's like a boar's head and like part of its torso. And Newt and her step up to like take an even closer look. And boom, they go down into this hole. And so obviously at that moment, you're like, oh, that was like a bear trap, you know, like an animal trap. Something comes for that meat, and then it falls in the hole. Now, when they fell into the hole, she missed all the spikes, because it's one of those with spikes in it. And But a big spike went right through um, Newt, had went through his side. And um, I don't, it was just that meaty part right there, 
your love handles that's the kind of part that it went through so I don't think it would have hit anything um, but he wasn't gonna get up so she tried to get out when she found out what was wrong with him she did manage to get out but she's lost can't find her way back to the others to get help and Newt is sitting there in this situation when we see the killer that we recognize from the first two movies he's grown up now and he jumps down you know climbs down a rope down into the pit and weirdly he grabs the boy and pulls him up off the spike very very un nicely <laughs> and drags him off and takes him to like this cabin like place which is where the Texas Chainsaw part of this movie comes in he takes him into the shed and he throws him up on the table which leads to one of the most you know if I did a list of the most disturbing scenes kills or scenes in a horror movie this would be one of them because you know when he throws the boy up on the table he's still alive like alive alive you know not semi-conscious not anything but like what are you doing and he like rips open his shirt and stuff like that and he like it's like this big machete thing and he just like starts sticking it into him and doing that right here and then moving up and it is an it is extremely disturbing scene because of, of the actor who did it was flawless because the way he screams and the sounds that are going on as this guy is just like eviscerating him alive is just it's, it's one of the most disturbing kill scenes that I've ever seen in a horror movie and um, so the boy is quite dead <laughs> um, but it was a disgustingly awful death and um, because of what it was about 20 seconds which in my opinion was about 18 seconds too long uh, but it was a horrible disturbing uh, kill so when John comes in or John's on the way back home right and he finds Siri has stumbled out into the road so you don't really know about this John guy because he just seems like somebody that hates everybody and doesn't want anybody to be around so you don't really know whether to think of him as an asshole or a threat but he finds Siri and he puts her in the truck and he goes on and he's you know she's begging for help and he's like okay I don't want to but I'll help you and then he gets back to the cabin and you see pretty quickly you're like wait a second that's the that's the cabin and the shed that that looks like where gun just brought that guy and killed him in the shed so John's got Siri out in the truck and he goes into the shed and you'll see in a minute what I'm talking about about how not really knowing what to think of John when he goes into the shed 
he walks over there to the table where this boy is laying and he literally freaks out you know I mean he starts screaming at gun he's like what the fuck are you doing what did you do um, so you're kind of confused you know like you don't know what to think of John but as he's screaming at him and he's telling me you know you're stupid you're idiot what are you doing and then he screams something that I think really puts a spin on this trilogy and that is that he screams at him you're a fucking idiot that is not an animal that is a human being now you can see in the shed that he is a trapper he is a hunter um, that's all he's ever been his whole life revolves around trapping and hunting and skinning and uh, you know fur and stuff like that that's obviously his livelihood so when he's screaming at gun that that isn't you know basically what he was saying was just because you found that in a trap an animal trap doesn't mean that you bring it home and skin it that you bring it home and whatever they call it what did my dad and them call that when they clean it clean the deer um, butcher it you know what I'm saying I don't know the word for that to clean it oh, whatever but anyway it, that's basically you could get that that's what he was telling like he was a retard who did not know that just because you found the boy in the animal trap does not mean you bring it home and cut it up like an animal dress it that's it dress it so you can tell I'm not a hunter I don't give a fuck about that shit I want my you know I'll just buy my shit from the store thank you very much if I want to hunt I've got a gun but it's not for hunting human I mean you know animals anyway but <laughs> That's obviously what he was telling the boy, was like, you cannot do that, and now you have screwed up, because the, he, you know, she had told him about them falling into the trap. So you're like, okay, so this John is not like a bad person. He's just a recluse hunting ass asshole however he takes her into the house pretty much tells her I'm just gonna keep you now <laughs> so I'm not saying he's nice and then he actually even like fixes a place for her in the basement which is connected to the shed and um, so she's got like a pen in the shed and then a place in the basement in the house so he's going to keep her so I guess he's just going to keep her as like a slave probably a sexual but you don't know whether he was going to do that before finding out that Gunner, whom obviously he really did take and keep, obviously the boy, remember the boy, or the sheriff came and asked him had he seen the boy? Obviously he had. And he ended up keeping him and raising him. So was he going to help her, like he said, when he first picked her up? Because he was very upset about what Gunn did. But then sort of was like, now that you've done that, we have to make all of these people disappear. So, 
I think he raised a psycho that needed help and that monster is loose now like you get a taste for blood so now that we know that Gunner has been with him all of this time and that sort of he sort of operates mentally on instinct so he had been raised to be this hunter who went out and that's all that they did for a living was this trapping and stuff so this obviously extremely mentally defective kid after what had been done to him um, and no telling what it did to his brain to be frozen in that snow till um, he managed to get out get you know and come and kill the parents so meanwhile while he was bitching them out Siri had went in there and found Newt so that's when the dude knew she really is just going to have to be my toy because he certainly can't let her go now because she has seen all of that so she gets locked up and that's what's going to happen to her we then wake up at the camp the next morning and we have what's left of our party as they do realize that you know where are Newt and Siri you know where are they at and they start looking around the woods and we then start seeing that Simon is being stalked so we know Gunner has come to do the business so that's a scary scene too where Simon is getting stalked because I don't know how to explain it when Gunner you know he realizes that someone's following him and right as he sees like you know over there in the bushes he is able to pick out a person that's standing there and there's a hand and he just at that moment man it's like one of those greyhound dog races when the shoot opens or a horse race gunner comes out that woods in a manner in which it will send you back in your chair I mean it's scary how fast it happens he comes at him he manages to get off a shot or two but I don't think it does anything and then that's it for him um, because Hedda comes along after hearing the shot and she sees Simon from the back you know like he's sitting over there by a tree so she walks over there and she walks around it and when she gets in front of him he, he looks weird and there's blood coming down like right here and she tries to move him and when she does his head comes off a big spike that's sticking out of the tree um, so it looks as though he had been grabbed thrown to the ground and then had had his head taken and jammed onto a big spike that was sticking out of the tree so that wasn't pretty um, she then goes screaming for manga and um, that's a guy and um, they start running they end up finding Anders and she tells them that she found Simon dead and they all start running then of course Gunner is after them so it's like a big Friday the 13th through the wood chase shit going on they manage to find this old abandoned cabin they go in it they find um, they get into the cellar where they stay for quite a you know quite a while probably it looks like they had been down there for like several hours and Manga is starting to get claustrophobic so he wants to get out so he actually is brave enough to look up there and see 
whether anybody's up there. And he says that it looks clear. So he gets out, goes up there, starts looking around, and I'll be damned if Gunner doesn't come back in. So this movie will really keep you tense. It doesn't allow you to relax, which is a good thing, I guess. But this movie does not allow you to relax. I found that's that's kind of interesting. It's very good at keeping your muscles tense. <laughs> um, but so here he comes in, and there. Him and Manga play this really neat, I'm in this room, you're in this room, you know, uh, he, he's coming around, so you go around that way, cat and mouse, right, and they film that really excellently, because they, they keep just missing each other, you know, Manga's really keeping an eye on him, and it's like, here he comes that way, so he goes around this way, it, 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 they did that really good. Then Manga notices that he goes upstairs. He runs and he gets the other two out of the cellar. And he's like, let's go. Now, your ass is like clenched like that, okay? The, the, the anxiety <laughs> that you feel watching this movie. So, they're trying to be extremely quiet and come up out of that cellar. And right as they're walking across the kitchen, because you know, he's up there. Right as everybody comes, somebody slips and drops the fucking cellar door, and it's like, bam. And you say it at the same time they do, it's just like, oh shit. And they all start running. And <laughs> I think I'm getting anxious just thinking about it. But um, so they run out of the cellar, they barely get out the door. He manages to grab Manga through the door um, Anders bites his arm which was pretty animalistically cool in my opinion you know instead of just hitting it no I mean Anders tries to take a bite out of that shit to get him to let go of that boy and had a um, oh she grabs like a 2 by 4 and is like bashing him through the through the door he finally lets the boy go and boot they all take off again um, they manage to get to a river. They get to the to the river, and uh, it's a pretty active one, you know. And um, so, just about the time they are starting to go across it and try to get Anders gets shot like right through here by a arrow. Remember, Gunner and John and them are hunters. Um, they don't really let you know, though. Did Gunner shoot him with the arrow, or was it John? I don't know. But, so he's shot, and he falls in the water, and he's washed downstream. And this is when they become separated, because they all get washed, which means they come up at different areas of the, the side. So, Hedda ends up finding Anders, though, where he had been injured, and... Manga has run off in another direction and he's got like a big arrow through his foot uh, through the boot and everything so he has to break that off and pull it out which that was pretty graphic and painful to watch um, it gets dark again um, Hedda and Anders are like hiding in the cliffs you know, of this river, and uh, Manga in manages to run across the sheriff's car, uh, his, like, Range Rover. Now, I think he's a game warden. No, 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 he's the sheriff. Okay. So, he manages to run across this car, the Range Rover, and he tries to hotwire it and stuff like that. And he, he doesn't know, he can't get the right wire. You know, he gets the ground, but then he like hooks it to one wire and it's the lights. And he hooks it to the other light wire. And 
scared the shit out of me. Probably my neighbors too, because I was watching these late at night. And um, he hooked up one of the wires, and the sirens came on. The, you know, cherries and berries came on, and it was loud and. That's not something you wanted to happen in the middle of the woods when you're being chased by a serial killer. Um, so that scared you as the audience member too, because you didn't see that coming. He gets manages to get that damn thing off, which you know has called gun. And he's fiddling with the wires again, and he gets the lights again, and the lights come on, and you see gun out there, but he didn't because he's looking down. And you're like, oh shit, he's gone. He's he's dust. Um, he's, he finds the right wire, almost gets it cranked when he is attacked. Now, Hedda had heard the siren, right? She had left Anders to try to go get help. So she comes up on the scene um, because she had heard the siren when it had screwed up and went off. And she gets there right about the time that he attacks Manga. So they start fighting and carrying on. Manga's trying to protect himself. She tries to stab a gun with a big screwdriver that she that was in the seat that Manga had used to get the wires out. And Manga gets, I mean, a... Uh, Gun gets the upper hand on Manga, and she had went around the other side of the truck, and he saw her. She didn't think he saw her when she had tried to stab him because she missed, and she didn't. He didn't. She didn't think he saw her, but then she realized he did. He drags Manga around the truck. She had went under it, so I guess he thought she had ran into the woods or something. But he throws Manga on the ground just long enough for Manga to look over there and see that she is laying right there underneath the car. So he then kills Manga ugly, twists his head, and she had to see that. So he drags him off, takes him back to the shed. Hedda goes looking, goes back to Anders and he drags Manga in there. I think he was dead. I hope he was dead. But Siri is in her cage, you know, in her little cage. And she sees John come in, I mean, a uh, gun come in again, pulling her friend, and then strings him up by his feet like he's going to dress a deer. And John comes in again. And once again, John starts raising hell. You know, you've really done it now. What if someone saw you? And I kind of thought to myself, I thought you told him to go kill them all. But maybe he didn't. I don't know. But I thought he did. But instead, he seemed very upset again about this situation. So he told him to clean up that damn mess. But now, this time, he really did. Because he looked right at him and said, you know there's two left out there. You have to go get them now. So, you think maybe that boy is still alive, maybe? But, he was going to make sure he wasn't anyway. Because when he walked by him, he like just split him from, you know, from balls to nose with the machete as he walked by to go out, like make sure he's bled out by the time I get back, right? And poor Siri had to see that, so she don't have a lot of her sense left. Um, and then we end up, morning has come, and Anders and Hedda are out there on the river being stalked. She realizes that if Anders doesn't get some help soon, he's going to die. One of the things that they have to do is get that damn arrow out of him that's stuck right here, stick it out. 
So we go through this painful graphic error removal, you know, to try to get that. And they come up with this plan, you know, what can we do? What can we do with this person coming because you just screamed like anyone would having an arrow pulled out? Um, so we know he's coming. And that's when he does show up as they expected. Now, they did some really quick work there because... They got Anders to lay across the boulder and act like he was dead or something, which made Gunn walk up to him when she jumps out from behind a rock with that big screwdriver that she had and runs it through him. And he turns around and attacks her, but Anders isn't really dead. So he jumps up and he bashes him over the head with a rock and gun falls into the water like he's dead and they take off. Now you know that ain't going to last, of course. But they are going and going and going and I'll be damned if they don't end up at the shed, at the, the cabin. And she runs up and knocks on the door, bang, 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 and John opens up the door. And you're like, oh shit. Well, what's going to happen now? <laughs> so, he, she tells him, please, I need to use the phone, I need help whatever and he's like okay he can come in I mean you can come in but he has to stay outside talking about Anders who is over there who had been checking the truck for keys so he's like you can come in but he has to stay outside so she goes in she's like thank you you know and she walks over to the phone and she starts trying to dial um, 112, which is their version of 911. Um, and it doesn't work. She can't get no ringtone. And in the meantime, you see John, you know, like looking at her funny and locking the basement, the cellar entrance. And they did that beautifully because the looks between them two when she was like I can't get no dial tone but you said I could use the phone what's up with that <laughs> but then she noticed the look on his face and he noticed the look on her face and like the look between them two was like they both looked over there at that shotgun at the same time and it was like they were both like froze for a second and you were like come on make a move bitch make a move <laughs> right? and she like jumped at it and he jumped at it but she got to it you know first and started to take him out but she didn't instead she's holding the gun on him and like you're going yes bitch <laughs> and she screams for Anders, who comes in. You know, he's like, still, he's, he's, they did good makeup on him and that he looked very pale. He looked like what he should look like in the situation that he was in. So, she's like, you hold the gun on him. I don't know what, I don't know what this motherfucker is hiding down in that cellar, but he was giving me the hairy eyeball about the cellar door. So, he, you know, Anders holds, on, holds the gun on him while she goes down the stairs and checks it out. And sure enough, what does she find down there? 
she finds Siri. And so you're kind of like happy for them, you know, it's like, oh my god, that girl, she got rescued. It was like really cool, but then again, that can't be the way this goes. <laughs> so she's all happy and freaking out down there. And um, let me see how it happens. Uh, Calls in Anders, yeah. Okay, so they end up running back upstairs. Her and Siri run back upstairs. I mean, I knew all this. I just, you saw me. I was like, okay, let me, the exact timeline so I don't mix it up. So they run back upstairs. There's this big hullabaloo in there. And they're holding the gun on John. Now that they've got Siri, her and Hedda and Anders can fucking leave in that truck. So they grab the keys and Siri runs to the front door with Anders and Hedda following and she jerks open the door and you know that fucking gun is standing right there and immediately puts a big machete right through her fucking guts and you're like man just ain't gonna cut me a break are you with any of these people <laughs> so they're all standing there like really stunned like what the fuck I mean haven't we done enough work to live through this movie okay it's not fair <laughs> is what it is so she falls on the floor they're all sitting there stunned and then um, John that gave John the opportunity to grab the shotgun away from Hedda. So, when she grabs the shotgun away from Hedda, or when he, John grabs the shotgun away from Hedda, he turns around and he shoots Anders. And so, Anders is now injured even more than he already was. But he gets out of the way with just like a scathing wound. He gets out of the way and John and Gunn face off, right? Because instead of worrying about Hedda and Anders, who is like creeping ever closer to the cellar door stairs, John is too busy giving Gun another bitch out. You killed her, Sari, you right? That was his little sex toy that he had took taken. And so he is screaming at John about killing her. Completely forgetting Hedda and Anders standing here who are kind of stunned watching them two face off. And He's calling him all kind of names. I should never have fucking saved you. I should never have gotten you out of the ice. I should have let you die. Because you see, what had happened was when they had buried Gunner in that ice for him to die. Because they hated him because of his facial tattoo, tattoo, birthmark. Um, he, had, he had seen... He had rescued him, brought him back to the house, healed his hypothermia, and that's how Gunner then went and killed his parents. So he is now screaming at Gun that that was a mistake. I should have never fucking saved you out of the ice. I should have never kept my mouth shut when you when I helped you go take revenge on your parents. I should have never helped you. It obviously, you know, because you're a freak, you, you're you mentally messed up from having your brain frozen. You know, he, he is just like ripping him to absolute shreds, which then 
all of the sudden probably triggered uh, gun grabs the shotgun away from him like in a split second turns it on him and blows his ass away meanwhile Hedda and Anders they have ran down into the cellar into the room that Siri was in shut and locked the door and they're trying to get out but how do you get out well there's nothing but this little there in the corner um, so they start trying to get out of it while Anders is holding the door Hedda starts trying to get out of it and it's not working she can't get up there to it just like Siri couldn't get up there to it and he is putting the machete through the door so what Hedda does notice is that over there is a big can of petrol and matches and shit. Now why Siri didn't do that? Well, then again, you want to burn yourself up? That's not really a rescue. So that's probably why Siri never messed with it. But Hedda grabbed it and went over there and poured gasoline underneath the door and then set that shit on fire, which set gun on fire. While that was taking place, Anders, he jumps up there and is able to get to the window. And she's helping him up. And he manages to get out. He gets out of the window and rolls over. And of course you know the answer. Of course you know that Gunn is standing over him with a big giant spear and fucking gutsy and one more for good measure so that didn't work Hedda she now runs has to turn around and go well what the fuck he's up there just killed my boyfriend whom I have worked my ass off to save through the last 45 minutes of this movie thanks a lot she runs out through the burning door goes upstairs grabs the shotgun and right about that time the brother the sheriff he runs in he's arrived and he runs in to the to the door and there is his brother, John, laid out shotgun on the floor. There is Hedda with a shotgun in her hand. And he pulls out his gun. And he's like, put the gun down, put the weapon down. Now, this is when I really didn't like him. <laughs> I really didn't like him at this minute. Because... She had shot the gun, and he's laying there on the floor. Siri's laying there gutted. She had managed to shoot John, uh, John with a uh, gun, with the shotgun, when she came back up. So he's, of course, laying there doing his I'm in hibernation shit. And you got this dumbass sheriff who is standing there looking at Hedda like go and put the gun down and she's like I can't he's killed them all now she like everybody else in one of these movies knows the motherfucker is going to get back up so she doesn't want to put the gun down and the sheriff is like looking at her like put it down I demand that you put it down like fucking dibble you know useless the whole gang of them are useless so she's like right when she starts to like come to her senses and is like okay all right he's like i'm here to help you i was like mm -hmm. okay so right as she starts to put the gun down you tell me fucking gun stands up behind the sheriff which makes her instantaneously, instinctually, to save her ass, 
pulled a gun up, and the sheriff shoots her fucking ass dead, and you're like, She was a good final girl. You know what I'm saying? You're like, what a fucking waste. <laughs> final girl. It's like, fuck you. Kill the sheriff, please. But instead, gun is standing behind him because you see, the sheriff never saw him stand up. He was too busy killing our heroine. Yeah. So, I started to say the hero, but whatever. He's too busy killing our hero. And Gunn is back there just giving him the thanks. And walks out the door. Sheriff never sees him, never sees shit. He's too busy staring at the bitch he just killed. And you're like going, this is fucked up. <laughs> God damn. <laughs> what the fuck? So, you see the sheriff now toting the bodies out, you know, because the house is on fire, remember, from down the basement? So, the sheriff is like, he's already took out Anders, he's taken out John, and he's took out Siri, and he is walking out with dead Hedda in his arms, who was, she so deserved to live, you know what I mean? She was a badass bitch for 45 minutes of this movie. And she gets killed, not even by the killer. She doesn't even have the honor of being one of his victims. Instead, she gets killed by a fucking moronic, dibble-ass sheriff. That just pisses me off. Now... So the sheriff is taking all the bodies. He's laying there with this sad look on his face. And the screen fades to black and the movie ends. Just like that. I had some final thoughts. Let me pick that back up. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, I, I actually wrote infuriating. <laughs> Okay, here I'm going to make myself feel better again. That's why I wrote this. Infuriating, but had to be as it is a prequel. Gunn had to escape to be in the next two films, chronologically. This, of course, the movie ends, as I said, it faded to black. As you see Gunn going over the hill to his parents' lodge where he is now going to move in. And what, 88 to 2006? Um, yeah, so in 2006 is when our Cold Prey won team shows up to get murdered by him. So the end of Cold Spray 3 is him moving into the thing in 1988. So that's 18 years later is when Cold Spray 1 is going to take place. So there you go. One of my top 20 slashers of all time. Um, this movie is absolutely phenomenal. This trilogy is absolutely phenomenal. Um, to have them so... What I find as a cinema buff, what I find as a horror collector, so fascinating, as I said earlier, about this trilogy, is the way they are so intimately connected. This prequel was perfect in explaining the, the first two movies. Um, you really got to understand his backstory. I messed my hair up getting upset about the ending. But 
this movie was so perfect in explaining everything, giving you Gunner's backstory. And like you, you know, like I told you, I can separate. I feel absolutely terrible about what they did to that poor boy just because he had this facial birthmark hating him the way that they did and all those years 11 years of horrific abuse um, for being the freak as his daddy called him um, but to have all three of these movies be odes to other subgenres not just movies you have part three was a big big kiss to friday the 13th sleepaway camp and texas chainsaw massacre um a big kiss no no maybe not sleepaway camp um but that genre that subgenre camp lake forest movies the burning um yeah the burning would be better the Burning and Friday the 13th with a healthy dose of Texas Chainsaw because obviously these two people were crazy. His adoptive father, if you could call him that, raising him to be this psycho hunter um, and dressing humans like animals like they did in Chainsaw. Um... And the second one being such a big kiss to Halloween 2. And the first one being a subtle but noticeable kiss to The Shining. It's, um, it was just fast fascinating the way that they did that. And this movie was so action oriented. The, it kept you so tense. And the action was so cool great kills unique kills there wasn't a whole lot about this tr this um, you know I saw a lot of complaints especially about the third one we've seen this before nothing special I, I call bullshit on that because I don't mind seeing clones and if they're done right but you know just to hate something because you've seen it before then don't ever go to the movies again because this is 2022, and movies have been going on since 1890s, and um, there is no such thing. I mean, maybe to some 10-year-old who hasn't seen anything yet, but to most moviegoers like myself, um, variations on a theme is that, that uh, you know, it's like, I don't want any more M&Ms because I've had all those colors. There is so many, there's only so many colors of M&M. And there's only so many themes that exist. You know, you can do a vampire movie, but it can be different than the other vampire movies. Um, but it's still going to borrow. It's still going to have some of the same things. So, yeah. Um, I absolutely love this movie. I think you could tell I got like really trippy at the last 15 minutes there. Just like I did in the movie. The movie just had me about jumping out of my skin. And I just don't believe any slasher fan should not experience Cold Prey 3. You know. And this trilogy in a whole. So... If you get the chance, you might have a little difficulty finding Culprit 3, but I doubt it. Just keep looking on one of those uh, movie sites. If you know how to use torrents um, or email or anything like that, you can find the file floating around, you know, around. I would upload it to YouTube, but I don't know if it would get copyright struck or anything. I don't know. I mean, you're talking about a whole movie. I know a lot of people upload movies to... I know a lot of people upload movies to um, YouTube. I don't know if this one would be out of s the way enough to get away with it. I don't know.
but in any event, if you haven't seen this trilogy, you really need to. I appreciate you laughing at me um, as I got to telling this story. But I will see you in the next thing I do, hopefully, if I'm not dead. And um, yeah, so thanks for stopping by. This was a long one because I wanted to talk about all three of them and wrap it all up and how much I love this trilogy as a whole and why. And um, urge you to give it a shot if you can find them. And um, yeah, so love you, miss you, bye. Thank you for dropping by. This is a rather long one, but it's okay. Most of mine are. No matter how I try, I can't shut the fuck up. So, always remember, never forget, you're a very special and unique person. Even if you've got a beautiful facial birthmark, you're okay. I would have just told him that he looked like a superhero. Or Paul Stanley from Kiss. You know what I mean? Star Child. I mean, come on. Can't you take care of a child with a facial birthmark? What? What? What's so? Can't you make something cool out of it? I mean, Jesus Christ, get over it. Instead, you're going to make a maniac that kills 100 people. But, love you, miss you, bye. See you in the next one. Keep screaming, but only when appropriate. And keep rocking very, very, very.